Good evening. We'll now begin the webinar. Today is October 4th, 2021, and the time is 6.01 p.m. This webinar is being livecasted and recorded and will be available publicly on the MTA YouTube channel and the Central Business District Tolling Program Project website at new.mta.info forward slash project forward slash CBDTP. By attending this virtual webinar, you are consenting to be recorded. Today's webinar will begin with opening remarks followed by a presentation on the Central Business District Tolling Program and then public comments. Only those who signed up to speak in advance will be able to give public comments. If you join the Zoom under a name that is different from the one you used when you signed up to speak, please identify yourself in the Q&A function with the name you used when you signed up. If you did not sign up to speak at today's webinar, you may sign up to speak at an upcoming webinar. To do so, please visit new.mta.info forward slash project forward slash CBDTP or call the public meeting hotline at 646-252-6777. Anyone who joined the Zoom may also use the Q&A function throughout today's webinar to ask questions or provide comments. Cart captioning and American Sign Language interpreters are available at today's webinar. We will now start with opening remarks from Dr. Allison Desireno, MTA's Deputy Chief Operating Officer. Thank you, and thank you all for joining us this evening. We are excited to be engaging in public outreach for this historic project, and we thank you for taking the time to learn more and share with us your thoughts and comments. Joining me today are colleagues from New York State Department of Transportation and New York City Department of Transportation as well as from the Federal Highway Administration, the lead federal agency for this project. We also have several individuals from our respective staffs here with us to listen to what you have to say. Your comments will be indexed and considered as part of the environmental assessment process. So with that, let's jump right in as there's a lot to cover. Our agenda for today is to review the proposed program, the project purpose and need, discuss the project alternatives, provide an overview of the environmental assessment and discuss and describe environmental justice considerations. We'll take a few moments to talk about the potential project effects and benefits and then have a public comment session. So how did we get here? There's been a decade of congestion. Congestion in New York City has consistently ranked among the worst in the United States. Local bus speeds in Manhattan are on average 7% slower than citywide speeds. Between 2010 and 2018, travel speeds decreased by 23% in Manhattan Central Business District, or CBD. And during that same period, multiple studies and panels explored how best to address congestion, including the 2008 New York City Traffic Congestion Mitigation Commission and the 2018 Fixed New York City Advisory Panel. Many of them came back with the same concept of congestion pricing. There is also a need for sustainable funding source for transit. Prior to the pandemic, nearly 75% of trips into the Manhattan Central Business District were made using transit. 95% of trips to the Manhattan Central Business District by low income populations are made using transit. MTA subway system is over hundred years old and must be repaired and modernized to meet the region's needs. And funding transit modernization would improve service and attract commuters back to the system, further reducing congestion. In April, 2019, the New York State Legislature passed the MTA Reform and Traffic Mobility Act. If approved by the Federal Highway Administration, this act would entail vehicles entering or remaining in the Manhattan Central Business District to be tolled. Net revenues would be used for public transportation capital projects, with 80% devoted to New York City Transit, 10% to the Long Island Railroad, and 10% to Metro North. The toll rates will be determined by the Triborough Bridge and Tunnel Authority, or TBTA Board informed by recommendations of the Traffic Mobility Review Board and after a public hearing. There are mandatory post-implementation reporting and evaluation requirements. To make sure everyone understands the area about which we're speaking, Central Business District Tolling Program Boundary is south of and inclusive of 60th Street. Tolls would not apply to vehicles that are solely using the FDR Drive, Route 9A West Side Highway, including connections to the UL Carry Tunnel, or the Battery Park underpass connecting the FDR Drive and Route 9A. Federal Highway Administration will serve as the federal lead agency for environmental review. They are responsible for reviewing all of our analyses to confirm that they are complete, and they will also issue the environmental findings for the project. 
Metropolitan Transportation Authority and its affiliate, the Triborough Bridge and Tunnel Authority, the New York State Department of Transportation and the New York City Department of Transportation are serving as project sponsors. With respect to the project purpose and need, the project purpose is to reduce traffic congestion in the Manhattan Central Business District in a manner that will generate revenue for future transportation improvements pursuant to acceptance into the FHWA's Value Pricing Pilot Program, or VPPP. The project would address the following needs. Reduce vehicle congestion in the Manhattan Central Business District and create a new local recurring funding source for MTA's capital projects. The following objectives further refine the project purpose. It would reduce daily vehicle miles traveled, or VMT, within the Manhattan Central Business District. Reduce the number of vehicles entering the Manhattan Central Business District each day. Create a funding source for capital improvements and generate sufficient annual net revenue to fund $15 billion for capital projects for the MTA Capital Program. And establish a tolling program consistent with the purposes underlying the New York State legislation entitled the MTA Reform and Traffic Mobility Act. So how is the National Environmental Policy Act, or NEPA, and the project linked? NEPA requires federal agencies to assess and consider the environmental effects of their proposed actions prior to making a decision. The project would be implemented through the Federal Highway Administration's VPPP. As a federal program, that VPPP, or Value Pricing Pilot Program, is subject to NEPA. Federal Highway Administration is the lead agency and has determined that an environmental assessment with extensive outreach is the appropriate level of environmental documentation for this project. There are two project alternatives. There's the no action. There would be no central business district tolling program, no comprehensive plan to reduce congestion in the central business district, and no identified transit capital revenue stream. And there is the build or act alternative, where we would build a central business district tolling program. There would be new tolling infrastructure and toll system equipment, implementation of a tolling program, which would have multiple scenarios in the environmental assessment to assess and identify the range of effects, positive or negative. And there would be creation of a new revenue stream for investment in subways, buses, and rail. A little more detail on the proposed central business district tolling program alternative. As noted earlier, tolls would be charged for vehicles entering Manhattan south of and inclusive of 60th Street. Passenger vehicles would be charged once per day, and there are exemptions required by the MTA Reform and Traffic Mobility Act for qualifying vehicles transporting persons with disabilities, qualifying authorized emergency vehicles. Central Business District residents with gross adjusted incomes below 60,000 would be eligible for a tax credit. And there would be a Traffic Mobility Review Board that would be tasked with recommending to the TBTA board the toll structure, including but not limited to a plan for credits, discounts, and or exemptions. Recommendations will be informed by a traffic study and must take into account multiple criteria, including the ability to generate revenue required, the impact on traffic patterns and volumes, public safety, air quality, among others. With respect to the toll, the environmental assessment is going to assess a range of scenarios and will be informed by robust public outreach. Studying multiple scenarios ensures that we understand the full range of potential environmental effects, including but not limited to congestion reduction that different toll rates may cause. Toll rates will differ in each scenario depending upon the time of day, how someone pays, and the inclusion and extent of any credits, discounts, and or exemptions beyond the two mandated by the enabling state legislation. Importantly, all else being equal, the more credits, discounts, and or exemptions that are given, the higher the toll must be in order to meet the project's purpose, needs, and objectives. The modeling is not complete and a final determination of the toll rates will not be made in the environmental assessment. Indeed, the toll rates, as noted previously, will ultimately be set by a vote of the TBTA board after the environmental review process and after the Traffic Mobility Review Board makes its recommendations. So importantly, these numbers I am about to share are for informational purposes and subject to change. With that said, to give you at least a sense of the range of potential toll rates, we anticipate that the easy pass peak period toll for automobiles will range from roughly $9 on the lower end to $23 on the higher end if many credits, exemptions, and or discounts are provided. The range of potential toll rates for automobiles using tolls by mail would be higher, roughly $14 to $35 for the peak period, again, depending upon scenario. Off-peak and overnight toll ranges may be lower, and tolls for trucks and other vehicle types would have different ranges. With respect to the study areas, 
The broad study area for the environmental assessment includes a region of 28 counties throughout New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut. There will also be more refined local study areas, including the Central Business District, as defined by the MTA Reform and Traffic Mobility Act, in other words, 60th Street and Inclusive and South, with those other areas excluded, as we described earlier, and neighborhoods near the Central Business District boundary where the project could have social, economic, or environmental effects. In terms of the key topics of the environmental assessment, this is not the full list, but we wanted to at least give you some sense of the kinds of things we'll be studying. Among them, as you can see, regional transportation, which is obvious, will be looking at highways and local intersections, commuter rail, subways, and buses, parking and pedestrian and bicyclists. We'll also be looking at social and economic considerations and conditions. We'll be looking at the visual resources, air quality, noise, and environmental justice, among others. Environmental justice is an important consideration for the project. Given that over 51% of the population within our study area lives in environmental justice communities, we're going to spend some time walking you through the federal requirements to address environmental justice and some of the tools we'll be using to engage with environmental justice communities. The term environmental justice refers collectively to minority and low-income populations within a project study area. In 1994, President Clinton issued Executive Order 12898, which requires federal agencies to consider the effects of their actions on environmental justice communities. In subsequent years, the U.S. Department of Transportation and the Federal Highway Administration have issued their own orders on environmental justice. Our environmental assessment must comply with all of these orders. The orders provide that Federal Highway Administration take the appropriate and necessary steps to identify and address disproportionately high and adverse effects of federal projects on the health or environment of minority and low-income populations to the greatest extent practicable and permitted by law. This slide shows the steps we'll be using in developing our environmental justice analysis. It is based on guidance developed by Federal Highway Administration and the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. As you can see, we begin by identifying minority and low income or environmental justice populations and environmental justice communities. We engage in outreach with those communities, as you can see by the little picture on the right. We then determine whether the project would result in adverse effects on environmental justice populations or communities. We consider mitigations for those adverse effects of the project, as well as potentially offsetting benefits to the affected environmental justice populations. Again, there is outreach and engagement during that process. If the effects remain adverse after mitigation, we identify disproportionately high and adverse effects. If there are no disproportionately high and adverse effects, the evaluation is complete. If there are disproportionately high and adverse effects, we evaluate further mitigations or alternatives to avoid or reduce those effects. The Federal Highway Administration Environmental Justice Order provides specific definitions for minority and low income populations. As you can see here, minority is defined by U.S. Department of Transportation and the Federal Highway Administration as a person who identifies as Black, Hispanic, or Latino, Asian or Asian American, American Indian, Alaskan Native, Native Hawaiian, or Pacific Islander, or individuals identified as some other race by the U.S. Census. Low income is defined by United States Department of Transportation and Federal Highway Administration as a person whose household income is at or below the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services poverty guidelines. For a family of four, the 2018 U.S. Census Bureau poverty threshold was $25,750 for the study area. Based on the definitions in the previous slide, we have identified the environmental justice populations in our 28 county study area. As noted earlier, and as you can see in this table, over 51% of our study area population is considered minority and over 13% is considered low income. This map shows the distribution of environmental justice populations throughout our study area. The map shows large concentrations of environmental justice populations in New York City and the immediately surrounding suburbs. There are also large concentrations of environmental justice populations throughout our study area. Our public outreach will engage with these communities as much as possible. One way we'll be engaging with the communities is through the creation of an environmental justice technical advisory group. This is a group of technical experts who have knowledge of environmental justice considerations and can share concerns drawn from throughout the study area. The group is comprised of community leaders, advocacy group representatives, and industry group representatives with specific interest in environmental justice considerations. 
Their purpose will be to identify concerns and mitigation if needed and help to ensure information is circulated as widely as possible to the larger communities. The technical advisory group will be by invitation only, and we anticipate the first meeting convening in early October of 2021. Potential participants will be contacted in advance. We will also be creating an environmental justice stakeholder working group. This is a group of interested members of the communities throughout the study area who would also like to participate beyond submitting comments or participating in the webinars. This group will be comprised of interested members of the community, and the purpose is to share concerns and request discussion on particular issues as appropriate. To suggest yourself or someone else, you may visit our website, or you may com to complete a form, or you can contact us by phone at 646-252-7440. We anticipate that the first meeting of this group will be convened in early November of 2021. And again, once we have all the names and contact information, participants will be contacted in advance. We're gonna review some of the potential effects of the project. Importantly, these effects are dependent upon scenario. The next slide will highlight some of the potential benefits, but I'll take a few moments to talk through the bullets here. We anticipate that there may be effects where there would be new tolling infrastructure and equipment, that there might be changes in traffic in neighborhoods near the Manhattan Central Business District, and that there might be traffic that diverts around the Manhattan Central Business District to avoid tolls. Again, dependent upon scenario. Near the Queens Midtown Tunnel and the Hewell Carry Tunnel, we anticipate some traffic diversions on the highway system that could result in more than a nominal increase in traffic. Preliminary analysis suggests this change in traffic would not occur on local roadways and would not adversely impact air quality or noise in the neighborhoods where the highways are located. However, we will be looking more closely at the neighborhoods adjacent to both sides of these tunnels. Some drivers currently travel through Manhattan, although their destination is elsewhere. For example, you may travel from New Jersey to Brooklyn or the Bronx by going through Manhattan. Preliminary modeling indicates that some of these drivers may change their routes and traffic may increase in certain locations depending upon scenario. We will be looking more closely at the extent of those increases in parts of Staten Island, Brooklyn, Upper Manhattan, and the Bronx, and whether they could result in notable changes in traffic, air quality, or noise. Preliminary analysis also indicates that new transit passengers who may take transit rather than drive will be spread throughout the transit system and will not overcrowd any particular route or line. Based on preliminary analysis, the shift to transit would not notably change access to transit, transit services, or pedestrian circulation near transit stations and hubs. In terms of tolls on low-income and minority populations coming to the Central Business District from throughout the region, a direct effect of the project on residents of the Manhattan Central Business District who are part of an environmental justice population is that they will be charged a toll to drive into the Central Business District. However, the MTA Reform and Traffic Mobility Act provides a tax credit for those individuals whose primary residence is within the Central Business District and whose New York adjusted gross income is less than 60,000 per year. Preliminary analysis has found that fewer than 1% of the Manhattan Central Business District's commuters are low-income individuals who drive, but nonetheless, we are assessing the economic effects of the additional costs for these customers. Tolls on the taxi or for hire vehicle industry which has a high proportion of workers who identify as minority as defined by United States Department of Transportation guidance are also being looked at. Industry data shows that a high percentage of taxi or for hire vehicle drivers identify as belonging to a minority population. Once there is a new toll for entering the Manhattan Central Business District, some passengers may no longer choose to use taxis and for hire vehicles. We will examine the effect of the project on the taxi or for hire vehicle industry and the resultant effect on minority drivers. With respect to potential project benefits, if approved, we anticipate the project would reduce vehicular traffic in and near the Manhattan Central Business District. Overall, and depending upon scenario, our models predict a 15 to 20% reduction in traffic volumes that would enter the Manhattan Central Business District each day. As a result, we would see improvements in air quality and traffic noise as there would be fewer vehicles. We also anticipate improvements in travel times within the Manhattan Central Business District, again, as there would be less congestion. And of course, the project would provide additional funds for subways, trains, and buses, funding the MTA capital program, which includes many projects to improve and expand subway, bus, and commuter rail service. This would benefit MTA's transit commuters, including environmental justice populations. I want to take just a moment to discuss or describe the anticipated NEPA schedule. We've already begun our outreach. That's what we're doing here today. And we anticipate that this outreach will continue through January of 2022 as we also prepare the NEPA environmental assessment. 
between February 2022 and May 22, 2022, there will be review with Federal Highway Administration of the document itself. And at the end of that period, the environmental assessment will be made available for public comment. Once the document is made available for public comment, there will be a public review period and a new comment period. That period will also include additional outreach related to toll rate ranges. Between that June 2022 date and December 2022, the work will be done to incorporate all of that information to make sure that the final outreach is done and ultimately to have Federal Highway Administration make an environmental determination. If approved by Federal Highway Administration, Future outreach and public hearings will be held as part of the implementation and traffic mobility review board process during 2023. Here is the list of all the public outreach webinars we are holding. As had been noted in the distribution materials prior, you may attend any one of these or all of these as you would like. We also have the three environmental justice outreach meetings. Webinars, those will be occurring on October 7th, 12th, and 13th with slightly different focus areas. But again, as with the public outreach meetings, residents may attend any one of the webinars they would like to. In terms of our stakeholder working group meetings, we expect the first one in early November, the second one in late November, and then we expect a third one in June of 2022 once the environmental assessment has been released for public review. Thank you. We will now move to the public comment portion of today's webinar. We encourage anyone joining via Zoom or live stream to take a short survey using the QR code or link currently being displayed. The link can also be found in the Q&A section of the Zoom. We're gathering public comments today to inform the environmental review process. Comments will be reflected in the environmental assessment once it is made public. Rather than responding to comments as they are given, we'll do our best to address specific questions whenever possible in the Q&A chat function. However, please understand that at this phase of the process, your question may be one that cannot be answered meaningfully until completion of the modeling and analysis. Anyone who joined the Zoom may also use the Q&A function throughout today's webinar to ask questions or provide comments. Please note that each speaker is limited to two minutes. We ask that speakers keep their remarks to the two minute time frame out of respect for all other speakers. We will be calling speakers who live in the geographic area that is the focus of today's webinar first in the order they signed up, but everyone who signed up will be called to speak today. If you have joined the Zoom under a name that is different from the one you used when you signed up to speak, please identify yourself in the Q&A function with the name you used when you signed up. When you're called on to speak, there will be a brief transition on your screen. Please make sure that once your screen updates, your camera and microphone are enabled before beginning your remarks. You will not be able to unmute or enable your camera until it is your turn to speak. Please remain patient until then. In the event you miss your name being called, we'll call the list one more time after all speakers in attendance have been called the first time. As a reminder, this webinar is being livecasted and recorded and will be available publicly on our YouTube channel and on our project website. By attending this virtual webinar, you are consenting to be recorded. We will now begin the public comment, por comment portion of today's webinar. Our first speaker is Congress member Bill Pascrell, followed by Jonathan Schweidel. You may begin your remarks. Uh, I'm here. My name is Congressman Bill Pascrell. I represent the 9th District of North Jersey. I'm here because once again, New Jersey and New Jersey folks are getting stuck with the short end of the stick. We in New Jersey are quite used to paying our fair share, but this proposed pricing scheme is a bridge too far. And New Jersey has barely had a say in the matter. Despite efforts to coordinate, New York is marching forward all alone. They're trying to jam a tax hike 
onto the backs of New Jersey commuters. It is wrong, it's unacceptable, and it cannot stand. Uh, many don't realize that Manhattan's roads are federally aid roadways. In the zone, there are 443 lane miles of federal aid roadways that have been renovated and upgraded thanks to countless federal investments funded by the American driver. 223 of those lane miles are part of the national highway system. It is unfair for New York to limit access to roads that we all paid for without consulting its neighbors and then charge an extra fee on top. This is an extra tax on New Jersey drivers. I call it chutzpah. Uh, I fear this so-called environmental assessment is a rushed rubber stamp. We need a full-blown environmental impact statement. We sent a letter to Secretary Budaswag uh, back in April, we outlined our many concerns and demanded only fairness. We have still not heard any reply. That is an outrage. President Biden promised not to raise taxes on middle class families. I hope federal officials remember the commitment as they review the scheme. We need a real environmental review on the impact of all stakeholders. Uh, well, our already overburdened mass transit is to be able to handle this. And so uh, you got the pitch that I'm presenting today. And I'm just wondering, won't the, the volume increase when folks in the in the zone and this is not necessarily, not necessarily CBD see that there's less traffic and then they'll join the traffic, which they never wanted to get into in the first place. Thank you very much for listening. I have much more to say, but there'll be plenty of time. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker will be Jonathan Schweidel, followed by Miguel Ramirez. Hello, thank you very much. My name is Jonathan Schweidel. I'm a resident of Jersey City and I support congestion pricing. There was a study actually released today which said that less than 2% of New Jersey commuters in the Manhattan Central Business District commute by a car as opposed to other modes like mass transportation. As a Jersey City resident, I live near Route 78. And one thing about living near there is there's a lot of traffic as well as a lot of environmental pollution. And the benefits from congestion pricing won't just go to New York City residents, as a Jersey City resident, having congestion pricing will make my life much better for those reasons. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next speaker will be Miguel Ramirez, followed by Isaac Alvarez. Uh, can you hear me? We can, yes, we can hear you. All right, there we go. Um, thank you. Um, uh, you can see me okay. Um, I just want to present, my name is Miguel Ramirez. I'm a permanent resident of Pacific, New Jersey. And I just want to uh, say the Central Business District Trolling Program, as presented, is not a good idea and for various reasons should be canceled or at least modified seriously. If the concern is, true, is truly traffic volume and pollution, Instead of instituting a massive electronic system that costs hundreds of millions of dollars to install, I would imagine, and creating another bureaucratic tolling system in the nation's already highest and most tolled area, an across-the-board ban on auto traffic during the proposed hours is a much better way to go. First, it truly cuts down on traffic and pollution, makes for a completely equitable system where no one pays for permission to pollute the air and is just to all motorists, regardless of one's income level. Charging drivers to drive in a regulated area sounds like a hypocritical system when those who pay a fee or toll have reign and freedom then, not offered to others, who may not have the means to pay yet another toll or fee in the greater New York area. It strikes up another way to raise revenue instead of true concern 
for creation and the stewardship of the environment. Finally, a complete ban on auto traffic, with exceptions, of course, for public transportation, would be much better, simpler to implement, and send a message that the city is truly concerned about pollution and traffic, and not digging for more cash from an overly burdened public with unreasonable and ever-present tolls. Finally, thank you for allowing for public discourse, and I sincerely hope that the concept be revisited and adapted to better serve its intention and the people of the New York metropolitan area. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker will be Isaac Alvarez, followed by Deirdre Huntley-Smith. Hello, my name is Isaac Alvarez. I, I prefer not to use my video. Um, anyway, uh, yeah, so uh, this is not a terrible idea to have congestion pricing. I, I live in South Jersey, um, so I, you know, it's not like I commute to New York on the regular, but I do have family in New York uh, and go there every now and then. And but, but I still feel for people in North Jersey, and I think the real elephant in the room is that there is inadequate uh, transportation, uh, mass, mass transit across the river. It is absolutely unacceptable that there are only two tracks in the North River Tunnel. We need a, a far greater regional connectivity like they have in Europe. Um, also, the, the PATH train needs to be better, especially on weekends. I'm not sure if this uh, congestion pricing is going to be done on weekends. I think it's better not to do it on weekends, uh, especially also, you know, the subway, there are the GOs and the commuter rail, Metro North and LIRR, it's, those don't run as much on weekends. But other than that, I will say that there, there needs to be credit for people who already use the, the toll bridges and tunnels, so they're not double charged. And just because it'll reduce congestion doesn't always mean everything, you know, like these car-free streets and you know, removing parking space are always a good thing um, be, because they do inconvenience people. And yes, I realize there are issues, but you know, it, you, you want to be careful if you're going to force people to change their lifestyles. And lastly, I'll say well, two things. First, there needs to be transparency about the benefits, the specific improvements to mass transit that congestion pricing will allow for. And I'll, I'll end off on this. This cannot be a substitute for taxing millionaires and billionaires who are responsible for most of the pollution in the first place and have much more to give. Thank you. Our next speaker will be Deirdre Huntley-Smith, followed by Claude Cornetti. Thank you. I hope everyone can hear me. My name is Deirdre Huntley Smith, and I am a resident of Rahway, New Jersey. I am also a motorcyclist belonging to the Sirens Women's Motorcycle Club of New York City and also the Moving Violations of Boston. Um, and I'd like to talk about the Central Business District Tolling Program with respect to how the toll is going to be applied to all vehicles. There is currently no discussion about an exemption for motorcycles. Motorcycles and scooters are two wheel vehicles that can help to, to prevent some of the congestion and, and some of the environmental impact that we currently experience on our, our streets. Um, it is, there are studies that have been shown that the if, if more cars are taken off the street and more people were riding motorcycles and scooters, we would see a, a significant um, decrease in congestion and also uh, a significant decrease in our, um, our, our footprint on this earth. I'm also concerned uh, for the people who live north of the 60th Street um, because they are going to bear the increased traffic potentially from people who are trying to find ways around um, the central business district tolling area. And I would suggest that we need to look at 
some other alternatives to how this to be done. It seems a bit rushed to me, and I don't believe it's well thought out, and that it's not really going to benefit uh, minority areas as well as uh, the federal study is um, suggested we should. Thank you. Our next speaker will be Claude Cornetti, followed by Diana Feinberg. Hello, can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, this is Claude. I'm a resident of Bergen County. Um, and with respect to the Central Business District tolling program, I do have, um, you know, three comments to make. So the first one is we definitely need to improve mass transit options uh, coming, you know, I guess from New Jersey into Manhattan. Um, I do believe that New Jersey Transit is at a breaking point with respect to um, its infrastructure. And I do think that um, given that the MTA is just an equal partner uh, as far as public transit agency, uh, to the extent that you know the revenue comes in from this tolling program, that should be shared with the regional transit agencies, uh, particularly because New, New Jersey folks coming into Manhattan do contribute to the economic uh, welfare of New York City. Additionally, uh, I believe that the tolling program should not be put into place until the gateway tunneling project will actually uh, be completed. Uh, I know that that is a pretty extensive project. Um, it was unfortunately um, you know, killed off by the previous uh, administration, but I do think that that is important in order to allow um, you know, higher uh, train capacity going through the Hudson tunnels uh, from New Jersey to New York. And uh, the, the last point I have to make is with respect to commercial transit into the uh, CBD area, uh, I do believe that those deliveries should be scheduled uh, in the night hours so that, you know, if deliveries do happen during the day, that I believe those uh, companies doing the deliveries should bear a, a heavier uh, brunt of, of the impact of, you know, um, environmental issues, uh, pollution. I, I do believe that there's a lot of trucks, a lot of times when I go on my commute to Manhattan that basically do uh, come into the, the city Please conclude your remarks. The morning hours. So I do believe uh, that, you know, commercial transit should be uh, making those deliveries during the night hours. And with thank that, you. I thank you for your time. Thank you. Our next speaker will be Diana Feinberg followed by Ronald Simoncini. Diana? Sorry, had a little uh, little trouble connecting here. I apologize, a few, a few glitches. Uh, my name's Diana Feinberg. Thank you for the time this evening. I am a resident of Bergen County, New Jersey, and a professional planner, and also speak as a board member of the Meadowlands Chamber and Fair Congestion Pricing Alliance. I'd like to share a few thoughts. Uh, while it may be appealing to look to outsiders as a source of funds, in the long run, it would be more equitable and effective to engage all the region's partners, including New Jersey, in solutions to transportation issues, including transit investment, particularly when the whole tri-state area is still struggling to rebound from the pandemic. And one of the legacies of that pandemic is, of course, the continuation of work from home, hybrid work arrangements, and a resulting flattening and extension of peak hour travel, which prompts many questions. Uh, one, how will this trend factor into calculating the toll prices? Will the traffic impact studies accurately measure these trends for New Jersey? 
We've read that only a fraction of New Jersey commuters drive, but that's based on pre-pandemic statistics, which can't be relied on now to accurately assess the impact on peak hour or off-peak late shift workers. It also raises the question, if such a small number of drivers will be affected, how will the MTA achieve its funding goal, particularly when revenue will be net of the system's operating costs, which have not been identified to date? Uh, is there any congestion price point? I wonder that will be off limits, although necessary to meet the statutory target. Uh, these many questions show the complexity of congestion pricing and reinforce the importance of including New Jersey as a full partner in the process. I would also point out in relation to alternatives in the assessment that the 2018 Fixed New York study did identify other, member, other measures for reducing congestion and raising revenue. Uh, such as studying and assessing bus congestion. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next speaker will be Ronald Simoncini, followed by George Polari. Hi, folks. I'm Ron Simoncini from the Fair Congestion Pricing Alliance. I wanted to echo uh, Ms. Feinberg's comments, which I think are probably the most thoughtful and informed uh, that we've heard on any of these hearings, and certainly uh, more revealing than what we've seen in, in the outlines for the study itself, which largely relies on uh, environmental justice uh, to make its case. And it might ring true if the fact was that you could transfer any of these drivers into public transportation from New Jersey, which you can't, because we don't have the capacity. I think if you look at the various programs that are happening right now in the transportation area in the, re in the region, uh, this certainly is something that needs to be looked at, but it's not the priority. The priority for all of us is getting Gateway done. The priority is the Port Authority bus terminal. The priority is using CARES Act money efficiently so that it, through the region, eases transportation woes for drivers who encounter bad roadways and difficult logistics. So that's where our priority and our thoughts should be. I, I think if you're looking for a signal as to how poorly thought out this plan was though, you, you have to look no further than the recent coverage of it. You have to look no further than the fact that our governor, who's one of the most sedate people on the planet, is saying that he might reject and, and uh, veto the Port Authority's minutes to stop this. Our congressman, both a relatively progressive congressman, uh, Bill Pascrell and, and Josh Gottheimer, a more moderate person, both of them have their own reasons for rejecting this. And I think when you look at all that and you sum it all up together, you guys are in a beauty contest that you're running as judge and you're a contestant. And I think you're going to win that beauty contest like anybody would win a beauty contest where they're the sole judge. Somebody needs to come in and referee this thing as an independent third party who doesn't have a dog in the fight. And if you were honorable, you'd invite that person in now and end this charade. Please conclude your remarks. Thank you. Our next speaker is George Polari, followed by Thane Wren. George? You're currently muted. Hello? We can hear you. Okay. Uh, there's been a lot of good comments so far. And to add mine is that I think we can all uh, agree that there is a congestion problem. Uh, it stands to reason that a lot of the people living in Manhattan are in favor of this. Uh, this tax, uh, which is in addition to a toll, which is also a tax. My complaint is that over the years, the city was asking for this, has caused most of the congestion. Um, they, uh, and, they, and they want the people to pay for it. The city has sanctioned dozens of high-rise residential buildings, uh, over 100,000 units over the last few years. Uh, they created uh, sitting areas that took away from streets. Uh, Crosstown streets, uh, 
took away a lane for buses only, which I can understand is justifiable. Uh, more recently, lanes have been lost to bicycles, uh, both for um, riding and storage. Lanes have also been used for outdoor dining now. Uh, finally, after years of encouraging and promoting mass transit, the city has scared people away with the COVID-19 fear, and people are hesitant to uh, go back to public transportation. Um, and now, basically, what this ends up to be is a penalty on people that are trying to earn a living. The, um, the, uh, you know, th this tax is also going to subsidize MTA, which I understand they need it, but the MTA uh, is also being subsidized by other, you know, both federally and the bridges. And how much more, um, you know, can the people people pay? That's all I have. Thank you. Our, as a reminder, there will be a brief transition after you are called to speak. Please make sure that once your screen updates, your camera and microphone are enabled before you begin your remarks. Our next speaker will be Thane Rain, followed by Ralph Gatto. Good evening. My name is Thane Wren, and I'm a resident of Hoboken, and I'm here to speak up in favor of this proposal. It's already been noted that uh, more, more New Jersey commuters into Manhattan take public transit than drive. It's also the case that substantially more uh, New Jersey commuters into the central business district in Manhattan take public transit than drive. And also, as I think uh, we're all aware, on average, driving commuters have higher income than public transit commuters. So these relatively affluent drivers, uh, even though they have relatively small numbers, they impose a cost on everyone else that is far higher than their small numbers. And that cost includes the cost of noise, of air pollution, and just the space they take up on the roads, bridges, and tunnels that takes away space from public transit commuters who are much more efficient at getting into the city. And it's been mentioned that there's concerns about the capacity. Well, the goal, I think, of this um, uh, business district tolling program would be to shift some of those drivers onto transit. Even a small number shifting onto transit would greatly ease the congestion and allow more people to use those uh, access points into the city. It's also important, and a, a point that I don't think has been made enough yet this, this evening, that we speak up for the substantial environmental benefits that New Jerseyans would reap from this proposal, um, especially for residents of cities along the major traffic corridors uh, who currently suffer adverse effects from traffic congestion into New York, uh, including noise and air pollution, uh, and of course, the common experience of having traffic back up onto our city streets. Uh, when there's too much, uh, too many cars trying to get into the tunnels or onto the bridges. Uh, so easing some of that congestion through this business district uh, tolling program would significantly improve the environmental quality of life for the large number of New Jersey residents who live along those traffic corridors. So it's a great proposal and I hope it goes forward. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker will be Ralph Gatto, followed by Leslie Stevens. Ralph? Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, my name is Ralph Gatton, I'm a resident of Bergen County, and today I would like to express my opposition to any form of congestion pricing in the central business district of Manhattan. Clearly, a congestion pricing plan is discriminatory for that portion of the traveling public that requires access to or through that portion of New York City, even if only for minimal occupancy for travel elsewhere within New York City. For example, it's unclear if the proposed pricing details uh, thus far revealed define entry into the Central Business District to exclude exiting the FDR Drive at 71st Street, 61st Street, 53rd Street, for the purpose of transitioning to the 59th Street Bridge over the East River. Likewise, charges for exiting the FDR onto the local streets to access the other East River bridges in areas below 60th Street are unclear. What is clear is that such vehicles are not the core of congestion to the central business district. Origin destinations are common to New Jersey residents from any of the New Jersey counties to the other boroughs of New York City, 
and the congestion pricing initiative will have significant negative financial and discriminatory, discriminatory effects on New Jersey residents. Moreover, access into the central business district by New Jersey residents denies New Jersey residents access to significant work, medical, entertainment, and social opportunities simply because other forms of reliable, cost-effective, and convenient mass and private transportation options are not available or are clearly impractical. It is, is it for medical uh, patients to, that desire New York City's major hospitals in the central business district to pay a toll to avail themselves of such services? I think not. Um, it should be clear that while mass transit may serve a significant uh, number of New Jersey residents, it, it does not serve all. For regular commuters, it should be obvious that that portion of New Jersey residents entering the central business district by car simply do not have other practical, economic, efficient, or convenient transportation options available. No amount of MTA funding will ever satisfy their specific transportation. Please conclude your remarks. That concludes my remarks for tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next speaker is Leslie Stevens, followed by Doug O'Malley. Can, <clears throat> can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Um, hi, I'm Leslie Stevens. I live in Somerset County, about an hour and a half from Penn Station via New Jersey Transit. I represent the nonprofit 350 NYC, where our large team of activists support congestion pricing. The overarching goals of congestion pricing are three, as we see it. One, to reduce the traffic congestion that has come accelerating back already 90% of pre-pandemic levels. And this is with many people still working remotely. Two, ensure the viability of public transit in New York City, especially the subways and buses, and the connecting transit to places like New Jersey. Three, reduce emissions, both greenhouse gases and polluting toxins like nitrogen oxide and small particulate matter that are known health hazards. New York should have the world's best and greenest urban public transportation, including New Jersey Transit and PATH. Right now, we need a regional connectivity and fund sharing. New Jersey Transit is in dire need of upgrades to encourage people to return to transit. Uh, I also want to just comment that New York City contributes about 30% of greenhouse gas emissions, mainly from cars and trucks, New Jersey is 40%, and with worsening congestion, traffic is driving up greenhouse gases. We have less than 10 years to stop this runaway climate crisis. Um, we must implement congestion price, pricing quickly, learning from the best of other cities, and include major disincentives to gas diesel vehicles. And to incentivize public transit and shared modes of transportation. Thank you for my comments. Thank you. Our next speaker will be Doug O'Malley, followed by Christopher Pryor. Good evening. Uh, my name is uh, Doug O'Malley. I serve as the director of Environment New Jersey, which represents more than 20,000 uh, citizen members and 60,000 activists across the Garden State. Uh, we are still reeling from the impacts of Hurricane Ida, which clearly showed the impacts of extreme weather across the metropolitan area, as well as wreaking havoc on roads and transit. We also need to remember the largest source of air pollution in the metropolitan region comes from our cars and trucks that we drive. 75% in New Jersey, 66% across all of New York, those numbers skyrocket for lower Manhattan. And while we're still dealing with the impacts of the pandemic, we've seen a near total rebound of car and truck traffic in New York. We have not seen that same rebound for New Jersey transit or for strap hangers as a whole. We are at a critical moment of time that we need to provide dedicated funding for transit for both MTA and New Jersey transit. And we need to do everything we can to ensure that we're providing a, a congestion pricing plan. This project isn't perfect, 
It should be strengthened to include more funding for projects that benefit New Jersey strap hangers and give New Jersey more of a say. And the reason is very simple. 80% of New Jersey commuters into New York are strap hangers, but obviously folks traveling into the CBD are also coming from New Jersey. And so we know that New Jersey transit strap hangers are paying twice. Our drivers should, should pay as well to ensure that we are improving mass transit options. Um, specifically, that means that we uh, should have New Jersey Transit have a seat on the MTA congestion pricing board. We should ensure that revenue should be shared with NJT and PATH and have a focus on projects that help all of us, like the Gateway Project, like uh, the GW Bridge and having a dedicated bus lane there, and making sure that we're doing more to analyze the traffic across the bridge in Jersey City, Hoboken, Fort Lee. Let me just conclude by saying that this is an idea whose time has come. The debate has happened for years, and we need to do everything we can to reduce air pollution and increase funding for mass transit. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker will be Christopher Pryor, followed by Michael Goals. Uh, hi. Um, I'd like to start off by saying thank you for giving me the time to speak. Um, my name is Chris Pryor. I live in Newark, New Jersey, um, and I'd like to register my enthusiastic support for congestion pricing. Um, congestion pricing is such an exciting first step in the direction of more livable, healthier communities in North Jersey. Um, right now, excessive driving is doing so much harm and doing so much to pollute our communities, both in New York and in New Jersey. Um, and in New Jersey, we have, we have drivers clogging our roads as, as they head into those tunnels into Manhattan. Um, congestion, congestion in our area is an emergency. We have more congestion than ever. There's been an increase in car accidents and pedestrian deaths. And you know, let's not forget in Newark that one in every four kids has asthma. We are literally gassing ourselves. Um, reducing congestion has so many benefits. Um, you know, several of the speakers have outlined those better than I can. Uh, it makes our cities better places to live, reduces noise, helps the buses go faster, improves our transit. Um, it's going to make not only New York, but also all the cities in the New York area better places to live. Um, so I enthusiastically support the MTA in implementing congestion pricing. I urge them to get it done as soon as possible. Um, you know, as has been said, um, we've been talking about congestion pricing since 2007. Uh, now is the time to get it done. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker will be Michael Goals, followed by Diane Martins. Hello, can everybody hear me? Yes. Yes, hello. My name is Michael Goals. I'm with the Fair Congestion Pricing Alliance. Uh, a lot of has been said, very, very, um, educated uh, throughout the presentation this morning, uh, especially through Diana Feinberg, uh, a very, very educated uh, uh, city planner. And, and uh, a lot of what people are saying today is very, very valid. We need to cut congestion, we need to clean the air, but the only way we can do that is by increasing public transit. And by increasing public transit only on the New York side, it's not gonna have a true value. Unless you increase the efficiency of New Jersey transit, it's not going to happen. I lived in New York for 10 years. I took subways. Often, I would not take the subway. I would walk 30 blocks instead because the subway was unreliable. And guess what? Fares kept on going up and the service got worse. And let's look at this. Second Avenue subway line started in 1972. The first or second part of it just got completed a few years ago. So if you think this is going to help out increase the MTA's public transit deficit, it's wrong. It's not going to happen. Another point is, is that these meetings are almost a dog and pony show. What happens here is the MTA is letting us feel like we're giving our opinion. But once they close, the book's closed. New Jersey does not have a seat at the table. And that's what we need. New Jersey needs a seat at the table. The federal government needs to get involved to make sure this process is equitable for the entire region and not just New York and not just the MTA. For congestion pricing to work, 
and it's inevitable and what it's supposed to be is to involve everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Diane Martins, followed by Angela Fulci. Diane? Sorry, I was having an issue with the unmute. <laughs> Apologies, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so hi, my name is Diane Martins. I'm here today to also share my enthusiastic support for congestion pricing. Um, although I'm a central Brooklyn resident, I am a native uh, New Jersey uh, resident and um, I travel to Hudson County almost every weekend. My typical trip consists of a short subway connection to World Trade and then a 20 minute path ride ending either with a two mile walk or a bus ride but really depends on the bus schedule. It's not very frequent. Um, unfortunately, trains and buses are not as ubiquitous as cars in New Jersey as they are in many New York City boroughs. And I do wholeheartedly believe that congestion pricing in Manhattan will put more pressure on New Jersey legislators to expand more sustainable and equitable transportation methods for New Jersey commuters. Current congestion not only compromises emergency vehicles and other critical travel, but also burdens public health for New Yorkers. Car pollution causes asthma, premature death, and lung cancer. Do we need another environmental review to believe the science? I don't. Car emissions are also responsible for accelerating extreme weather patterns. Ida was a test, and with dozens of fatalities, the states of New Jersey and New York failed the test. If we want a greener future with less environmental injustices, we have less people driving cars. I'll end with one last point. Just on Saturday, Governor Murphy tweeted, climate change is real. In New Jersey, we're combating this threat and protecting New Jersey's future for generations to come. To my neighbors in New Jersey and Governor Murphy, climate change is real in New York City too. And New Yorkers deserve to be able to protect their future for generations to come also. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Angela Polci, followed by David Cavallin. Angela? You're currently muted, Angela. You are currently muted. Uh, I'm hitting on mute. Did, did that go through? We can hear you. There we go. Okay. I'm born and raised um, in New York, and I have a home in New Jersey. I'm already paying a hefty $16 toll on the George Washington Bridge with extensive backup caused from the Cross Bronx that's never been properly addressed. Does New York have a congestion, price, uh, a congestion uh, problem? Yes. But the majority of the increased congestion is definitely the result of the changes made in the city with the current administration. Bus lanes, bike lanes installed but never planned out well. Um, we also then have the construction permits that are given out like free candy, taking up lanes practically every block in the city. Let's not forget the inappropriate parking plaques that are provided by the mayor's office that take away even more parking. Then you have the filming industry they used to give they used to give one block for filming now they're giving up to 10 blocks and in most cases for two or three days of filming there goes more parking um they've taken away excessive metered parking giving it for commercial parking only so the regular cars have absolutely no place to go and um the double parking has become insane which is the biggest issue of of the problem it's one of the leading causes um, the meter agents, and I've spoken to numerous, they are told not to ticket the double parking vehicles, the double parked vehicles. They're saying that they're told that the New York uh, Police Department is supposed to handle it. You talk to the New York Police Department, including internal affairs, and they say they're too busy. So I hope this is addressed. Why, I haven't heard anyone speak of this. And um, I mean, obviously, it's a big issue and we shouldn't be penalized because the city is mismanaging you know, it's terrible. Um, 
I'm just so frustrated by this. I could hardly speak, but I think you get the gist of what I'm trying to say. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker will be David Cavillan, followed by Sonia Cessna. Our next speaker will be Sonia Cessna, followed by Andrew Ludasi. Sonia? Hello. We can hear you. Good evening. My name is Sonia Strenstad, Director of Active Transportation at the Tri-State Transportation Campaign. We appreciate the opportunity to provide public comment today in support of congestion pricing as a targeted approach to reduce traffic congestion, enhance the availability and reliability of public transit, and improve local air quality. A recent tri-state analysis made the fin following findings and recommendations regarding this policy's impacts on New Jersey. Public transit is the primary mode of choice for the majority of New Jersey's Manhattan-bound workers in every district that was analyzed. Of those commuters, as many as 70% transfer to MP MTA transit modes once they reach the CBD, all of those commuters will directly benefit from the upgrades to the MTA system funded partially by the tool tolls. We recommend that in addition to prioritizing accessibility improvements across the systems, it should focus on major stress points which tend to be placed with large numbers of commuters from New Jersey. This includes urgent capital improvements needed at and around Penn Station. Tri-State urges a collaborative approach in regional transit planning. We urge Governor Hochul, the TBTA, MTA, and the Traffic Mobility Review Board to work with New Jersey Governor's Office, New Jersey Transit, Port Authority of New York, New Jersey, and both states' DOTs to improve mass transit options, operations, and service in and out of the CBD. This includes serious consideration of dedicated bus lanes, working to ensure capital improvements at Penn Station benefit the riders of New Jersey, prioritizing new tunnels and the Gateway Project, and working with the Port Authority to approve not just the Authority bus terminal, but actual service in and out of the terminal as well. We can't afford to delay any longer. The health of our residents depend on it. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Andrew Ludasi, followed by Justin Greenman. Andrew? Andrew, if you unmute. Um, yeah, I'm here. Um, I live out in um, Mercer County. My issues with um, the congestion pricing are a number of things people have already said. So my talking points, I have to reduce them to ones that haven't already been brought up. Um, one of the major issues is the inequity of transit service, and it's not necessarily for New Jersey, but for people in New York. The transit deserts that were studied when congestion pricing was originally proposed back in uh, the Bloomberg administration showed that the people who drive most to Manhattan are those people who have the worst transit options. Um, my view is that we need to improve the transit before we introduce the congestion pricing. One of the other big impediments to transit ridership here is extreme inequity in, in the fare structure. In Europe, 
they have integrated zone fares. It doesn't matter whether you're on a bus or a train or the subway, point A to point B costs the same. For New Jersey commuters, they're already paying a very high New Jersey transit price. Then they have to transfer to the subway or the bus system and they're paying again. Same is true for Long Island Railroad commuters, Metro North commuters. They then pay again on the MTA. Basically, the fare structure should be changed and transit should be improved before congestion pricing is introduced so that you have an equitable system for both people using cars and transit. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Justin Greenman, followed by Kader Garab. Hello, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Justin Greenman, and I want to thank you for taking this opportunity to listen to me and to allow me to speak. Uh, I come to this meeting, like many of the other uh, speakers, kind of wearing a variety of hats. I was born and raised in Scotch Plains, New Jersey, in Union County. I'm currently, though, attending New York University, obviously within the Central Business District Zone. But really, my opinions about congestion pricing come from my childhood. My dad, grew up in Queens, out in Fresh Meadows, and until his parents passed away, we would frequently commute to his parents' house out in Queens. And as anybody who has tried to commute through Manhattan to an outer borough knows, one of two things. One is that it's almost impossible to do it by public transportation. It would have required at most a train, probably switching at Newark, because there's no one seat ride from where I am subway through the city and a bus once you get out to Queens. And the second thing you'll know is that you often change your commuting direction based on the traffic. Sometimes we would go through the Lincoln Tunnel and through Manhattan, if that was good. Sometimes we would go through the George Washington Bridge and up the Major Deegan and out that way, if that was good. Every once in a while, we even did the Holland Tunnel and down that way through Brooklyn, if that was the way that was good. If the past year and a half have taught us anything, it's that trying to control the way that people move about is going to be unsuccessful. And I see it every day is filled with bike uh, stations that are still filled with 95% bikes. That is to try to cut down on people from parking. And all it does is create idling and even more congestion. All that this result is going, all that this congestion pricing is going to cause is people from New Jersey. It's not gonna cause them to take public transportation. It's going to cause them to try to get into the city through the George Washington Bridge, which is going to back up the rest of the Manhattan that's outside of the congestion pricing zone. It's going to back up New Jersey. And I urge everybody here to please recognize this include your remarks. The tri-state area and reject congestion pricing. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Kader Garab, followed by Sunny Ng. Hello, this is Kajira Garab. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Um, I am a yellow cab driver, and I think, um, and I'm going to speak for congestion as a whole, my, my whole perspective. Um, I believe that the yellow cab sector should be exempt. I'm with them protesting um, and for a number of reasons. One, the yellow cab sector should be exempt because they're mandated to be on the streets in Manhattan um, from 96th Street, which is unfair. And there are people who are struggling. Um, with um with this with this surcharge um and it puts a lot of responsibility on some of these individual medallion owners and so um i'm speaking on their behalf and um i have um other perspectives um on the congestion because congestion is a problem in new york city um and part of the problem is the outdoor dining um you know some of the bus lanes on 34th and 42nd street um the no no turn no right turn no left turn on 30 42nd and 5th are 42nd Street and 7th Avenue. Yes, and 8th Avenue. And these things are part of de Blasio and Bloomberg, their failure, and they created some of the congestion. And so I think, um, and, and taxis are paying for it, and there's a limit on the number of taxis in the city. So, I, and also I think trucks should be exempted because if trucks aren't exempted, the wholesale prices would go up.
Thank you. Yes, hold on, hold on. The next speaker is Sunny Eng, followed by Jason Anthony. Hello. Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Sunny Eng, and I'm a resident of Brooklyn. I'd like to voice my support for the Central Business District Calling Program. Regardless whether or not the MTA needs the funding, I believe there should be a much higher barrier for people to drive into a place as populated as dense as Manhattan, especially given the number of public transit options available. And we didn't now, not 16 months later. I work in the Hudson Square area, and since the pandemic, it has only gotten worse with constant honking and idling from car drivers trying to get into the Holland Tunnel. If that's an indication of anything, is that driving is way too cheap and way too easy in Manhattan. To achieve this, the pricing program should happen 24 seven. We should have no exemptions, not for city workers, not for the police, and not for those who can live in the CBD, and definitely not those who make more than the area me median income. We should also adjust the congestion charge with the various bridge tolls to prevent toll shopping. One can just look at Chinatown and see how disruptive car traffic is to the neighborhood when commuters are driving through Canal Street only to get from New Jersey to Brooklyn and to avoid paying tolls. However, the final income, sorry, however, the final outcome should be that everyone that drives into the CBD today will have to pay more when this, when this program is implemented. Though I'm aware that this is not within the scope of this meeting, I also think that the city should stop providing free on-street parking, period. We should be encouraging everyone to take transit. Also, the MTA needs to provide details on how they're going to improve service once the program kicks in. If we're anticipating people to switch modes, the, MT the MTA needs to step up and tell us how they're going to accommodate those who have been new to taking transit. There needs to be more bus service, especially across town routes in downtown, and off-peak service um, for the subway. Also, the NYC DOT needs to implement better bus and bike infrastructure within and outside of the B CBT to adjust to the new reality where more people will be taking those modes of transportation. Thank you, everyone, and I hope you implement this as soon as possible. Thank you. The next speaker is Jason Anthony, followed by Regina Dorman. The following two, I'm sorry, Jason, you may begin with your remarks. Uh, yes, Jason Anthony from the Amazon Labor Union. Uh, again, I'm in full support of the congestion pricing, but with some exemptions. One, everybody has to pay their fair share because we have seen some elected officials from the central business district tolling asking for exemptions. That should be a no, no. Everybody, including Jeff Bezos, who has a penthouse at the Fire Iron District, has to pay their fair share. Also, those who in New Jersey has to have a seat in the table. And those who rely on the Port Authority tolls also should have a seat in the table. Because what happens if the gateway tunnels collapse? The whole Northeast Corridor will be incommunicated because of this. So I think the MTA should have all parties involved in the table and no exemptions whatsoever. So that's all I have to say. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next two speakers are Regina Dorman and Devin Gould. If you are signed up to speak, but have not heard your name called this evening, please indicate this in the Q&A function. Thank you. Our next speaker is Regina Dorman.
Regina Dorman. Hello? We can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you for letting me speak. I'd like to make three points, please. Um, I want to speak to the elderly, particularly elderly disabled patients who use NYU Langone Health and NYU Langone Orthopedic Hospital for physical therapy. They are physically incapable of navigating the subway system with their walkers, with their canes. Some of them need hip replacements. These elderly patients on fixed incomes who can only be driven in or drive in should not have to pay for the MTA on the backs of their um, meagerly fixed income. For those New Yorkers with permanent disability tags, not just permanent disabled license plates, there should be an exclusion, and these people should not have to pay because they are physically incapable of navigating the subway system. Number two, earlier tonight, someone said that drivers are wealthier. That is not true. My friends and I have cars that are 16 years old. We are in debt for our higher education, but we carry heavy items into the city. We could not possibly do so and carry these heavy items on the subway or bus. It's not fair to make drivers pay for the MTA. Finally, I'd like to state that people have talked about pollution. Cars are going to be mandated to become electric in the future. All cars manufactured in this nation are going to be required to be electric vehicles. There will not be air pollution from the electric vehicles. So air pollution should be discounted as a factor for the future in basing um, congestion pricing. Thank you very much for listening and for your consideration. Thank you. Our final two speakers are Devin Gould, followed by Michael Riley. If you're signed up to speak but have not heard your name called, please indicate this in the Q&A function. The next speaker is Devin Gould. Hi. Oh, hi. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hello? Hi. Uh, thank you. I've had the great fortune in my life of living in many places in the New York metro region, um, including Manhattan, Queens, and Central Jersey. And I'm here to voice my strong support um, for congestion pricing. It's a really important part of raising revenue for mass transit. Um, it will make our streets safer. It will make our air cleaner. Um, and it should be implemented now with a uniform rate. Um, uh, because that is the fairest way to do it. Um, everyone who decides to drive a private motor vehicle into Manhattan should be asked to pay the same amount for that privilege. Um, and I, I think it's important to realize that the overwhelming majority of commuters from New Jersey um, will be exempt from this because they are choosing to take uh, mass transit, whether that's ferries or buses or trains or bicycling, um, they, the vast majority of NJ transit, NJ commuters um, will be exempt from this. Um, I think a couple of people have talked about how um, this should wait until Gateway is done. Everyone wants Gateway to be done. But um, we should also keep in mind that um, part of the reason we don't already have a second set of tunnels under the river is because New Jersey's previous governor decided to kill the ARC tunnel and divert that money to roads and bridges. So if the previous governor hadn't have done that, uh, we would already have um, a second set of tubes under the Hudson. Um, so we need to finish Gateway. We need congestion pricing now because it will benefit everyone and make our streets safer and cleaner and generate revenue for mass transit. Thank you. Thank you. Our final speaker is Michael Riley. Hi, everyone. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to speak. Uh, I can start my video. Great. <clears throat> Hi. Um, yes, I am fully uh, in support. I, I, I live in northern New Jersey. Um, I commute regularly to Manhattan. Uh, for the most part, I use uh, trains. Um, but occasionally, I have to drive for various reasons. We have a, a <clears throat> uh, someone we take care of who is uh, in, in need of medical help, and their, their primary doctor is in Manhattan. Um, so... I feel that the opportunity to, and I say opportunity because I mean this, for everyone to collectively 
sort of bear this responsibility to make the streets safer, uh, to reduce traffic in one of the most congested, dangerous zones on the planet, really, or certainly in, the, in this country. Um, it's just a benefit to everybody. I'm fully in support of the congestion pricing plan as it is, as was just stated, as a as a fair and equal charge for all drivers. Um, and, and the benefits will far outweigh, you know, the, the, the argument that eventually we're going to have electric cars, whatever. Well, we don't have that now. And we've seen things like this discussed in my lifetime for decades. And we're still under the burden of cars burning fossil fuels and, and other vehicles. So you know, the time to take action on this is now. And uh, again, you know, as someone, I've also driven professionally um, in in the city, in the five boroughs. I, like I said, I now live out here in, in Morris County and this should have happened a long time ago. So now is a perfectly good time to start this. And as somebody who commutes in and yes, occasionally takes their private car, I am fully in support of this pro program. Thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you all for joining us this evening. For those who did not do so already, we encourage you to take our short survey via the QR code or link currently being displayed. The link can also be found in the Q&A section of the Zoom. For details about upcoming webinars and how to sign up to speak at them, please visit new.mta.info forward slash project forward slash CBDTP or by calling the public meeting hotline at 646-252-6777. As a final reminder, in addition to the virtual public webinars, there are several other ways you can provide comments, ask questions, or make requests. We encourage the public to comment via the CBDTP website new.mta.info forward slash project forward slash CBDTP. You may also email comments to cbdtp at mtabt.org or send them via mail to CBD Tolling Program, 2 Broadway, 23rd floor, New York, New York, 10004 or call 646-252-7440. The time is currently 7.28 p.m. This concludes our webinar. Thank you again for your participation.